This episode is sponsored by Simple Practice. Running a private practice is rewarding, but it can also be demanding. Simple Practice changes all that. This practice management solution helps you focus on what's most important, your clients, by simplifying the business side of private practice like billing and scheduling. Stick around for a special offer at the end of this episode. This episode is also sponsored by Lisa Marie, the Sassy Wealth Coach. Lisa Marie, the Sassy Wealth Coach, helping you take the chaos out of your business numbers. Join her for a Sassy Money Strategy Session, where you focus on your business and your financial needs. Stay tuned for a special offer at the end of the episode. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is the podcast where we talk about all of the ways that therapists' lives intersect with their work, the way that our work intersects with our lives, and all of the other things that we just generally don't get taught. And one of the unique areas that we have the opportunity to discuss today with our guest, Moses Farrow, LMFT, is around the idea of transracial adoption. And this is something that, you know, just in popular life, we see this happening in the news quite a bit. And Surprise, surprise, this is not always a super easy thing for adoptees to go through. And when these kinds of issues end up in the therapy room, there really is a unique experience that comes along with that. So thank you very much for spending your time with us today and being able to share some stuff that's hopefully going to help some people out there. Well, thank you so much for having me on your show. We're so excited to have you here. And I know that I was kind of uh, Facebook stalking you. There was so many great things that you were, you've been putting out and reached out to you. And I was very pleased that you were able to join us. But to get us started, we'll ask the question we always ask, which is, who are you and what are you putting out into the world? Mm, that's a great question. My name is Moses Farrow. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. And what I'm putting out into the world are three things in particular. I have been a mental health advocate. I'm also a practicing therapist. And I'm focusing my, my time and attention these days on mental health advocacy and suicide prevention particularly among the international intercountry transracial adoptee community. So these days I'm talking a lot about uh, what it means to be an Asian adoptee, what it means to be uh, an Asian American, and the struggle that we're having around racism, as well as mental health, as well as this uh, extraordinary increase in the suicide rate, um, which I, I want to highlight right off the bat uh, that research has revealed uh, among adoptees the, the uh, rate of suicide attempts is four times higher than people who are not adopted. I want to highlight uh, a new nonprofit. It's called the Guide Foundation that I am leading the mental health team for. And its mission is for adoptee education and mental health advocacy towards suicide prevention, particularly among the international intercountry transracial adoptee community. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much. I know that personally, I have several clients who are transracial adoptees from Asian countries. And so I was very excited to have this conversation with you because I know that there are I'm certainly things that I'm missing. And the first question that we ask oftentimes is a little bit, it's phrased negatively, but this is for learning. And it's, what do therapists often get wrong when working with transracial adoptees? So I'm going to uh, kind of flip this question around. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have that happen frequently. You, you've, had, you've had good media training where it's don't answer the question that you're asked, change it to something that you do just want to talk about. <laughs> Um, and why not be right up front about it? Uh, the, the way that, I, that I'd like to answer this uh, has to do with putting it into a context, really. And mm -hmm. there, the two things that come to my mind right off the bat is that for a lot of adoptees, not all adoptees, but 
for a lot of us, we go through this process that we call coming out of the adoptee fog. And this is looking into so many of the, the layers that create the adoption experience for us. So we're looking at how our, our identity is formed over a lifetime. We're looking at the family context. We're looking at the social context. We're looking at the adoption practices that really speak to adoption being more of an industry rather, rather than something that um, creates families. So I want to dig into these kinds of things as a way of educating therapists and anyone who, who's listening about what our experience is. And I want to start off with, uh, Kurt, you mentioned transracial adoption or transracial adoptees. And it's important to distinguish that there are different types of adoptions. And there, so that create different types of uh, adoptees. So transracial could mean uh, in, intercountry. It could mean domestic. It could mean um, kinship because of blended family situations. So that's a really broad community that, you, that you've, you've mentioned. Um, so the uh, population, the community that, um, that I like to speak mo you know, most to is the international or intercountry transracial uh, adoptees. Mm -hmm. And through this lens, those of us who come out of this fog come into a reality that undoes, that unteaches, that, what I say, pull, pulls back the layers, pulls back the veils on the narratives that we've been told uh, as, we, as we grow up. So speaking directly to when we're adopted, the, the overarching narrative that adoptive parents get is you're saving this child and by doing so you're bringing them into your family so when you when you adopt them they're yours so raise them as yours regardless of what country you've adopted them from regardless what race what culture they're coming from the important thing is that you're creating your forever family and that's really wonderful that's a very nice thing to say to the adoptive parents. What this does for the adoptee, though, is it creates all this internal conflict about who are we, where do we belong, am I really white, um, or am I really Korean? How do I reconcile these disparities? How do we reconcile the fact that we look, we look the part, but not necessarily we didn't grow up with our native cultures, with all those references to food, music, and, and cultural traditions. The second part to this is for adoptive parents who recognize, yes, it's important for their development, for their identity development. Yes, we'll send them to culture camps. We'll, you know, teach them how to play instruments. We'll, you know, support them finding their birth families. But all of this, again, kind of comes after the fact. Mm -hmm. comes at a later time in our lives. So this life trajectory really starts happening as we're teens and into young adults, and then later in life as we start families and start raising our own kids when we're recognizing, oh, it'd be great to have these reference points, you know, to pass on to our kids. So it becomes more of an intellectual process. It becomes more of a um, an inauthentic process for us. So it still lingers. Well, do we really belong in our native cultures? Uh, are we really accepted by them? And for many of us, we're not. So we go through life with this struggle that is mostly unheard and unseen and invalidated. So to answer your question in, in this kind of roundabout way, a lot of therapists don't really get the underlying layers, the, the uh, nuances of this adoption experience that we go through. And first of all, just sitting here in awe of being able to in 
you know, you're talking about in this roundabout way, but I also think in such a succinct way of being able to describe the complexities of all of this. And for a lot of us, knowing just even cross-cultural education for a lot of graduate level therapists is minimal. And then to get into the hyper-focus of adoptees, and thank you for adding to you know my wording around trend transracial and I now I'm just kind of sitting here and thinking like all right these are a lot of the issues and these are a lot of the the layers of, of sitting back there how do therapists help to tease some of this out in a way that feels productive and not inadvertently being dismissive of going through that learning process so what the therapist can do and this is something that we are looking at, I think, as a society as a whole, is that we need to start looking within ourselves. We need to start identifying our own personal biases, our own uh, personal blind spots. We need to start becoming more open-minded and certainly spend the time to educate ourselves. There's wonderful, wonderful references and books and blogs and videos and documentaries. I mean, there's a, a plethora of information and research and literature about the adoptee experience. And there are uh, really amazing people in the adoptee community themselves who uh, have spent a long time carving out uh, what their experiences have been and building these communities uh, around what our experience has been. So, so yes, uh, education is key. And I encourage people to go to certain blogs and read certain books. There's one that comes to mind is uh, The Primal Wound. A more recent one is The Body Keeps the Score. There are people like uh, Holly McGinnis, Amanda Baden. There are people um, like Jessenia Palmer uh, from I Am Adopted, uh, who have spent um, a long time helping people raise their voices and share their stories. So there are trainings as well on adoption competency. Uh, I've heard that they do a, a good job of helping people get the, the broader strokes of here's what it is. Uh, but I, re I appreciate your, your comment that there are so many complexities. And one of the, the challenges is that there is not one single adoption experience, um, that uh, it, there is a range. And so there are adoptees who are adopted into really wonderful families and really have a wonderful family life and upbringing and uh, become you know, very successful, well-adjusted people. Uh, however, on the other side of the spectrum, um, there are adoptees who are uh, um, choosing to uh, kill themselves, who are dying by suicide, who... Uh, can't get over their traumas. Uh, so, and then the many degrees in between. So yes, it, it's hard to call yourself an adoption therapist um, or that you're a therapist that can, can really uh, work with, um, with adoptive families or adoptees. Uh, it is important to understand that there is such a broad, uh, broad range of experience. And we'll include links to all of these things in the show notes. Thank you, Moses. I really appreciate those resources. I want to talk to a specific issue that I'm finding in the conversations I'm having around this topic is this idea of identity and kind of the neither nor or not fitting in either here or in the country from which they were adopted. And I think this idea of how do I define myself? What is family? How do how does family be? how was family created? It seems like there is a lot of things that, that those of us who have not been adopted kind of organically just take in. 
this is my family. These people are like me. This is, this is, I can trace my roots. I can look at these things. Whereas when you're adopted, whether, whether or not you find your adoptive family later in life as a child, I think it can be pretty hard to, to figure out where do I come from and who am I? And so I just, I'd love to hear your thoughts around exploring identity with an adult adoptee. Mm, mm. It's a wonderful question. Uh, we can spend hours on this one. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, so uh, hopefully I can, I can tease out some, some things to highlight and, and maybe encourage some, some provocative thoughts and, and maybe spark some discussion that goes beyond what we, what we bring up here. Uh, that, that would be wonderful. So in terms of talking about identity formation, this is something that I feel is universal, adoption or not. Mm -hmm. You know, um, who are we? Why are we here? What's our purpose in life? What's the meaning of life? I mean, you know, these are big philosophical questions I think so many people uh, uh, ponder about and spend time on. But particularly for what you're asking, intercountry transracial adoptees, what is really our trajectory of forming our identity? Uh, and I want to start with Amanda Baden, who had recently published a new piece of research about when to tell children that they're adopted. And would you know the conclusion is as early as possible. Uh, the earlier you can help a child start forming their identity and say, okay, I, I am adopted. And what does that mean? And here's the different ways beyond just do I look like my, my family? Uh, do I look like people from my native country? It goes beyond uh, skin deep, right? Sure. Um, the, the interesting phenomenon as a transracial adoptee is because of this narrative, as I explained before, where we're put into these forever families and we're raised as one of theirs, we oftentimes don't even see ourselves. We see ourselves as uh, our white relatives. And as we grow up and as we become more exposed to other people in our lives and other perspectives who say, yeah, you're Asian. And more to your point, uh, Katie, Asian doesn't cut it. And these days I'm saying we need to get rid of these categorical mm -hmm. ways of thinking and really understand our individualism. We need to appreciate that within our countries, there are different ways that we, that we parse out our identity, our individual uh, way of living, uh, our traditions, and so on and so forth. So as we go through life and we're then hit with other perspectives from our friends, from our coworkers, uh, from strangers, uh, you know, who may give us a look if we're out, you know, with our family, especially uh, for those of us who grow up uh, and live in very white communities, it, um, it's hard to miss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so as we go, go through life, we're struggling, where do we fit in, in society? But then there's this internal struggle of, oh my gosh, what, so what does this mean that I'm Asian? What does it mean that I'm Korean? What does it mean that I'm Chinese? What does it mean that I'm Vietnamese? Uh, I don't really speak the language. Uh, I don't really have any cultural references. Uh, I may not have spent the time learning about uh, the history of my country. Um, and this really uh, sets us apart, makes us feel uh, even more different than, than we are. The added layer to this, Katie, is that we also have to face whatever internalized racism that we've grown up with. And that is imposed on us by, again, by society, yeah. by our family members, by our parents uh, and siblings, if, if we have siblings. Um, again, because 
if they don't check their personal biases, if they don't check their own personal prejudices and say, oh, yeah, you're, you're our son, you're our daughter, you're our child, we don't see color. Well, that's actually dis totally invalidating, discounting yeah. our Native culture and our Native cultural identity. And so carrying this on through life, and then, as I said before, we come to a, a transitional phase in our life. You know, our, when we launch into adulthood, when we launch into a, a marriage, when we launch into parenthood, you know, the, these um, pivotal moments in our lives when, oh my gosh, uh, what does this mean? And you have to do like that self-check of, oh, who am I? It, it an ongoing struggle for us. And so there are a good amount of supports these days. Thankfully, there are places where communities are being built and people are finding each other. I would say back in my day, we were often isolated. It was hard mm -hmm. to find each other. Um, so thankfully, there are technologies and things like the internet, that, that social media that help us uh, connect with one another, find each other, and, and realize, oh, we have a, a connected, um, a, a common experience. There are projects out there as well, like uh, recently Glenn Morey, who's a, a first-generation Korean adoptee, uh, created the Side by Side project, uh, which I really urge, urge you to watch. They are, uh, they curated, uh, stories from a uh, hundred Korean adoptees from, I believe, 16 countries around the world. And they all came together into this project and shared a piece of their story, uh, identity being a huge theme. So the interesting thing about this project is uh, he spoke with, uh, he and his wife spoke with adoptees from four or five decades, different decades. So really got to see the span of uh, the adoption experience over over time, which is really fascinating. I want to dive into some of this culture push-pull that you're talking about. And not only for therapists working with adoptees, but also working with the parents of adoptees of providing the support and the structure and direction even of just how to help facilitate this exploration of identity in food and music and understanding the other culture, uh, the originating culture of, of the adoptee in a way where family members may not really have a depth or understanding that are wanting to help to facilitate these conversations as early in life as possible, but maybe not necessarily having a direction to go with that. Uh, do you have any suggestions there? Uh, oh boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, two things come to mind, uh, Kurt. One is we need to address the adoption industry aspect that there have been long-standing policies, that there have been long-standing adoption practices, uh, starting with the home study all the way through finalization, adoption finalization. As you can imagine, the adoption process can take a long time for especially inter-country uh, adoptions where uh, I, I remember telling folks uh, it could take anywhere from four to six years even. Um, that's a long time to wait. In terms of the education piece for adoptive parents, uh, it really isn't uh, something that is standardized or, or regulated. There are, uh, again, a number of really wonderful books on adoption by adoptive parents, uh, social workers, as well as uh, adoptees. There are uh, courses that uh, adoptive parents can take. What I have uh, really appreciated is, are the adoptive parents or really prospective adoptive parents 
who contact me, reach out to me, and say, what can we do ahead of time? We're now understanding that there are issues like trauma, like depression, like identity issues, uh, attachment issues that we want to do our best to prevent. I, I hand it to those parents uh, who, want, who really want to give uh, their child the best chance at growing up and not struggling uh, as much as they need to. So uh, I really want to give a shout out to them. Yeah. Uh, and part of that, again, is the second part of, well, to really nail down the first, the first part is challenge those social narratives that are passed through the adoption industry. And there's overt marketing tactics and propaganda that's been used for decades. So if you, uh, I mean, if, if you do, do a search on social media, on Google, I guarantee the majority of the pictures you'll see are of children and infants. I, I just want to pop in here and not to steer this as a complete conversation about the adoption industry. The history behind it is atrocious. And I recommend, you know, if you're going to listen to somebody else's podcast, there is a two part uh, episode on the history of uh, the adoption industry here in America on Behind the Bastards, literally called The Invention of the Adoption Industry by the Woman Who Stole Thousands of Babies. And so it's a very dark topic that gets discussed in kind of a dark humor sort of way because it is so atrocious. But having listened to that before and hearing what Moses is talking about now, if you want to get into that depth a little bit, we'll link those in the show notes as well. Thank you, Kurt, for pointing that out. It is really important to move this process along. And one thing that I advocate for these days is the need for adoption reform around these practices. So uh, I, I've been asked before, do I believe in adoption? Do I believe in international adoption? Uh, yes. In certain circumstances, we want to do things in the best in interest of the child. But across the board, again, categorically, uh, I think we need to take a look at the uh, child trafficking aspects of the adoption uh, practices and policies. We need to look at the Adoptee Citizenship Act that is being lobbied for right now and has been for the last 13 years. We need to challenge these social narratives uh, that have kept the adoption experience in place for so many decades. So, what adoptive parents can do uh, for themselves, besides educating themselves and listening to adult adoptees, taking our stories, again, is really do their own work, go into their own therapy, look at their own attachment styles, look at their own family of origin issues, uh, um, heal from whatever traumas that they've experienced in their lives. This is something that I've seen across the board in the uh, decades so of particularly focusing on adoption therapy with adoptive families is the, uh, the previous generation's issues being passed down um, into the current relationships and then those get passed down. So there is a very strong intergenerational exchange of trauma, of uh, dysfunction, of addiction, of mental, mental illness, which you would think is only a genetic connection, mm -hmm. but those uh, relational dynamics and, and patterns also get passed down. So it's really important for adoptive uh, parents to go through their own process. And I, say, I don't say this very lightly at all. Uh, I say it with tremendous, tremendous amount of respect because I'm understanding that the adoption process for them 
is, isn't just the moment that they decide that they like a child, but that they have gone through history of trying to create their family, of going through uh, a, a variety of things before arriving at the option of choosing to adopt. It is important for them to be open to their own therapy and their own healing before making the decision to start a family or, or bring a new child into their family through adoption. I think that's so important. I think there's, in just talking about kind of the adoptive parents and that experience, I think there's often a lot of unhealed things and so much that is still present could, even if it's about the creation of family, and how important this adoptive child is. And, and you know, I've got a someone I know who has a transracial intercountry adoptee and then also was able to then get pregnant subsequent. And so now there's two kids, similar age, that grew up together. That it's just like it creates such complexity. I mean, it, it's, it's such a, a, a journey, I think, for the parents that can just – this is a little graphic, but can just kind of bleed over the kids and how the kids are raised and how the kids are, are able to form identity, what, what the meaning is of, of who they are. Like it just, I, I, I really appreciate the, the, the require, not the requirement, but the, the recommendation that adoptive, adoptive parents really do their own therapeutic work because it, it's such a huge decision. It has, it's so complex. It's not like, Hey, let's parent. It's let's parent someone who is from a different country who then has to go through all of these other elements of of identity development and attachment and all that stuff. So to me that's so important. I just quickly wanted to swing back to the the issue of race and culture because I understand you you'd mentioned some of the internalized racism and that kind of stuff, but I I I can imagine depending on where one grows up that that there's pretty intense racism, given that you look different than your family. And so I don't know if there's any additional thoughts to talk about there, but I just wanted to, to comment on that because I know recently, especially during the, the coronavirus and that kind of stuff, there's been an, an increase in racism towards especially Asian Americans because, you know, in America, we're apparently, we can't, we're swimming in racism. And so it just happens everywhere. But you you had initially been involved in the hashtag I'm not a virus and, and that kind of stuff. But I, I just I feel like there is there's so much that comes about, especially if you don't necessarily identify if you're kind of internally almost identifying as white and then having this racism in addition. It feels like there's there may be more to say and maybe there's not. But but I just wanted to kind of open that as kind of our final question. Okay. It could be a whole a uh, whole conversation. I recognize it's super big. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my final thought on racism in the environment that we're in with the coronavirus, the uh, outpouring uh, of anti-Asian racism and xenophobia, and which has now engulfed Black Lives Matter and uh, extended beyond in such ways where we are outwardly protesting against um, so so much uh, atrocities and death and, and um, uh, so what a way to end the show on <laughs> <laughs> in with <the> um, <laughs> uh, but I do I I do appreciate you wanting to go there. And I do appreciate, uh, you know, on this show, having, having a, a voice to, to say that, yes, as adoptees, uh, transracial adoptees, intercountry transracial adoptees, we do struggle with a different form of racism throughout our lives, mm -hmm. throughout our lives, uh, that often goes unspoken, that often goes unseen, unheard and even invalidated. And one thing about this uh, 
gets me thinking about microaggressions and how often they occur, even among friends, even among family members. And they are sometimes so subtle that they go unchecked. And there's so many uh, people out there saying, we have to call these out. We have to bring these to light. I'm, I guess you can say I'm starting a, a little bit of a new hashtag called Invisible Elephant. We need to address the Invisible Elephant. We need to put a spotlight on, on, on this. Um, as an Asian American, uh, with the conversation that we've had about identity, how do I identi identify myself? Do I identify myself as a Korean adoptee, a Korean American adoptee, an Asian adoptee, an Asian American, an Asian American immigrant? There's all these layers of identity that I say, yes, I'm all of those. Mm -hmm. And I have to be all of those because my voice counts, along with all the other adoptees out there whose voices also count and need to be heard. And so I, I appreciate that you are asking this question and providing this opportunity to say, as adoptees, with our complex layers of adoption experience, we also feel the tremendous pain of racism and xenophobia and hate crimes that occurs across the country, across the world. But for right now, I'd say it's really important to highlight Black Lives Matter. And for so many of us, as people of color, as uh, marginalized communities, it's a time we need to come together in solidarity, stand up for each other, and say we have to uh, keep putting this on the forefront or out there in the forefront uh, because now is the time, now is the only time we can act. So thank you so much, Katie and Kurt. This is uh, definitely an ongoing conversation. I wish we had another two or three hours. Yes. Uh, you know, maybe perhaps I can come back. We can delve deeper. We so appreciate your time and your experience and expertise on this. Uh, there's a number of things that got brought up in this episode that we'll put in our show notes. You can find those over at mtsgpodcast.com. Where can people find out more about you and your practice? I have a website, mosesfarrow.com. I am on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I am known as the adoption therapist on Instagram. Check me uh, at my email, moses at mosesfarrow.com. I had mentioned the Guide Foundation, where I am leading the mental health team. We're developing projects uh, for mental health advocacy and, again, education uh, around suicide prevention among the inter-country transracial adoptee community. That has its own website, guidefoundation.org. We are also on Facebook as well as Instagram. We've started our own podcast, the Guide Foundation podcast with uh, Adam Goodman. I'd say it's pretty easy to find me. So, <laughs> <laughs> And we'll include links to all those in the show notes as well. And once again, thank you for your time. And thank you to all of you listening. You really help keep us going and continuing to explore these wonderful and diverse and needed topics throughout all of our time. So we greatly appreciate that as well. And check out our social media and find out the latest projects that Katie and I are working on. So until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Renoy and Moses Farrell. Thanks again to our sponsor, Simple Practice. Simple Practice is the leading EHR platform for private practitioners everywhere. More than 60,000 professionals use Simple Practice to power telehealth sessions, schedule appointments, file insurance claims, communicate with clients, and so much more. All in one HIPAA compliant platform. Get your first two months of Simple Practice for the price of one when you sign up for an account today. This exclusive offer is valid for new customers only. 
Go to simplepractice.com forward slash therapy reimagine to learn more. This podcast is also brought to you by Lisa Marie, the Sassy Wealth Coach. Lisa Marie, the Sassy Wealth Coach, is your money manager in your back pocket. Together, you'll tackle this chaos in your numbers and create a money management system that works for your business. Lisa wants you to feel empowered by your numbers so you can grow your business and feel in control. Join Lisa for a sassy money strategy session where you'll spend 90 minutes focused on your business and your numbers. As a special offer for our listeners, Lisa would love for you to have $50 off your strategy session. Use the code therapy reimagined, one word, therapy reimagined, when you schedule your call. Visit the sassywealthcoach.com to learn more and sign up today. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 